seriously popular. Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. I don't know if you knew this, but anyone can get the same premium wireless for $15 a month plan that I've been enjoying. It's not just for celebrities. So do like I did and have one of your assistant's assistants switch you to Mint Mobile today. I'm told it's super easy to do at mintmobile.com slash switch. Upfront payment of $45 for three month plan equivalent to $15 per month required. New subscribers only. Renew for 12 months to lock in savings. Taxes and fees extra. Additional restrictions apply. See full terms at mintmobile.com. The two killers of 16-year-old Rihanna Jai have just been sentenced. We now can tell you uh, that they are Scarlett Jenkinson and Eddie Ratcliffe, both of them 16 years old. Um, well, there we have it, the sentence handed down there by Mrs. Justice Yip uh, for the murder of Rihanna Jai. Please take the defendants to the cell. Scarlett Jenkinson, for the murder of Brianna Jai, you will be detained at His Majesty's pleasure. I set the minimum term at 22 years, less the 352 days that you have spent on remand. Eddie Radcliffe, for the murder of Brianna Jai, you will be detained at His Majesty's pleasure. I set the minimum term at 20 years, less the 352 days that you have spent on remand. On the day the identities of Brianna's killers were revealed for the first time, that was Mrs Justice Yip, the judge, telling two teenagers they'd show no remorse for their crime and they were driven not only by sadism, but by the fact that Brianna was transgender. Scarlett Jenkinson and Eddie Ratcliffe were just 15 years old when they lured Brianna to a park on a Saturday afternoon by pretending to be her friend. Then they stabbed her 28 times and ran off leaving her dying. Throughout their police interviews and throughout this trial, they've blamed each other. But we learn today for the first time that Scarlett Jenkinson has confessed. She's admitted that, in fact, it was she who inflicted most of the stab wounds when Eddie Ratcliffe panicked during the attack. She also said she enjoyed it. And we can also tell you today that since being in custody, Scarlett Jenkinson has written another kill list of people she wants to murder. The sentencing hearing, which took place at Manchester Crown Court just a short time ago, came six weeks after they were convicted of Brianna's murder. In today's episode, we'll bring you all the detail and emotion from the courtroom. Because we can now reveal their identities, we can also talk you through what we know about their relationships. We can tell you that Scarlett Jenkinson only became friends with Brianna because she was kicked out of another school for giving drugs to a younger pupil. Just a couple of months later, she created this murder plan. She wrote it down and together with her friend, Eddie Ratcliffe, callously carried it out to the letter. We can now tell you that an independent review has been launched into how a schoolgirl was able to murder a fellow pupil from the same class. And today we'll hear from Brianna's family about how their lives have been devastated and changed forever. Welcome to episode 13, No Remorse. So, as you may expect, Caroline, for such a serious and high-profile case, Court 2 at Manchester Crown Court was packed this morning. Along with the barristers, police officers and journalists, there were lots of Brianna's close and extended family. Her mum, her dad, her stepdad and her sister were all in the courtroom. The mum and brother of Scarlett Jenkinson and the mum of Eddie Ratcliffe were in the courtroom, but neither of their dads were present. So the hearing got underway at half ten this morning and both the defendants were also in court. They were sitting at opposite ends of the dock, with their intermediaries, the people who looked after them during the trial, and three members of security sat in between them. So Scarlett Jenkinson was dressed in a black and white spotted wrap dress and a black cardigan with her wavy hair tied back in a ponytail. And she had a fidget toy with her, just as she's had throughout the case. And at points, Liz, we could see that she was doodling and sketching a picture of an eye on a notepad, which was on her lap. Eddie Ratcliffe was wearing a black shirt and trousers and a grey tie. His hair was long and loose 
and he was carrying a puzzle book sort of full of crosswords and you could see that during various points in the hearing he was completing some of these crosswords and he as well had a fidget toy with him. Both of the defendants could see their families from where they were sitting in the dock. And because we can identify them now, we can tell you a bit more about them. So we know they both came from pretty stable backgrounds and homes. We know they come from quite close family units. Scarlett Jenkinson's mum is a design and technology teacher at a Catholic high school and her father's a builder and plasterer who also teaches young people who want to go into the building industry. Similarly, Eddie Ratcliffe's mum is university educated and a graphic designer. His dad manages a haulage company and he's a keen amateur kickboxer who has his own gym. He taught his son to kickbox as a child and, in fact, Eddie Ratcliffe himself competed in the sport when he was younger. He also excelled academically and was in all the top sets at school. We also know, since being in custody, he's passed his GCSEs and he's now studying for A-levels and his ambition was to go to university to study microbiology. So, at the beginning of the hearing, um, Mrs Justice Yip addressed the media Um, Firstly, she lifted the reporting restrictions, which we know have obviously been in place since the beginning of the trial, and this meant that we could name them for the first time. Yeah, Liz, you were in that main courtroom and watching exactly what was going on today as usual. I was watching proceedings on a video link with many, 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 many other journalists across the country as this was live streamed, and, you know, you'll have seen most of the footage today streaming on every single TV channel across the country. And like in every other high-profile case that we've recently covered, the judge's comments were filmed. It's the only part of a court case in the UK that we can film that's allowed cameras in the room. And Mrs Justice Yip was damning about what she said happened in this case. Yes, she was. Um, Her sentencing remarks took actually quite a long time, unusually long time, over getting on for 40 minutes. Mm. She said that Scarlett Jenkinson was the driving force behind the murder. And although Eddie Ratcliffe didn't share the same interest in murder and killing and torture, she said he gave her the support and encouraged her. The judge said Scarlett Jenkinson's plans to kill were like a project for him. But she was careful to point out that although he was led by her, he wasn't under her control as such. He was capable of saying no to her, the judge said, and forming his own opinions. She also wanted to point out that his diagnosis of autism was not an excuse for what had happened and made him no less culpable for the crime. The judge said they were both jointly responsible and neither had been truthful or shown any remorse throughout, she said. And Mrs Justice Yip also said that because Scarlett Jenkinson had changed her account of what happened, it was now impossible to believe anything that she'd said. And she said the fact she'd drawn up another kill list in custody of people who were looking after her in the secure children's home where she's being um, held, she said this showed that a huge amount of work would need to be done in order for her to be considered rehabilitated or ever suitable for release. Yeah, I mean, she did talk about not being able now to believe a word that Scarlett Jenkinson says because she's changed and flip-flopped her version of events since the the conviction um, and being sort of spoken to in the secure unit by various doctors. But she was clear, Liz, on the motivation for this murder. She said the messages that Scarlett Jenkinson sent showed that her primary motivation was a desire to kill. And if you listen to our previous episodes that have covered this trial, we brought you those messages at length. Um, Those WhatsApp messages between Scarlett Jenkinson and Eddie Ratcliffe um, that really did show her obsession, if you like, and her desire to kill and torture and inflict harm and that further obsession with serial killers and and sadistic forms of torture. Now, what the judge said was that Eddie Ratcliffe knew that Scarlett Jenkinson had these sadistic desires to see Brianna suffer and so he could not be absolved of responsibility as a consequence because he knew that was what she wanted to do. The judge also said that Eddie Ratcliffe, she felt, was motivated by transphobia. She said the messages that he sent describing Brianna as it were dehumanising, 
and she described those as an aggravating feature of the case. She didn't go, Liz, as far as to say this was a hate crime. She didn't use that terminology. No. That's another step. But she certainly said it was an aggravating feature. And the judge started by talking about Brianna. Sadly, no one will ever know what she would have achieved in her life. Even though her life was so short, she made an impact. Her family remember her for her laughter, for being full of life and as a good listener. Their loss is unimaginable, but they have bravely and movingly painted a picture of Brianna in the statements read today. They have my deepest sympathy. Scarlett and Eddie, you had been good friends from when you were 11. You were 15 when you killed. You, Scarlett, met Brianna when you moved school in October 2022. You got to know Brianna and she believed you were her friend. Brianna suffered anxiety and was nervous about going out. But on the 11th of February last year, you got her to meet you in Linear Park. For all her fears, she could not possibly have known you were a danger to her. But you too had been plotting to kill her and did so that afternoon. I don't want to dwell on the murder itself, but it was brutal. Scarlett, I have concluded that the primary motivation for Brianna's murder was your deep desire to kill. The messages reveal your fantasies and show your sadistic motives. Brianna's murder was exceptionally brutal. Your actions after the event and what you have told Dr Church confirm you enjoyed the killing. Taking all that evidence together, this was a murder involving sadistic conduct. Eddie, although your motives may not have been the same, you knew what Scarlett wanted to do and why. You understood her desire to see Brianna suffer. You actively participated in this brutal murder, knowing the sadistic motives behind it, and you cannot avoid the consequences just by saying you did not have the same desires. I find also that you, Eddie, were motivated in part by hostility towards Brianna because she was transgender. You dehumanised Brianna by constantly referring to her as it, and your messages about wanting to see if she would scream like a, a man or a girl and really uh, wanting to see what size dick it had, along with checking the night before the killing that Brianna was coming, show your own interests in killing Brianna linked to your hostility towards her as a transgender person. We'll be back after this short break. Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With a message for everyone paying big wireless way too much. Please, for the love of everything good in this world, stop. With Mint, you can get premium wireless for just $15 a month. Of course, if you enjoy overpaying, no judgments, but that's weird. Okay, one judgment. Anyway, give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. Upfront payment of $45 for three months required. New subscribers only. Renew for 12 months to lock in savings. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See mintmobile.com. So today was a really important day for this case and for Brianna's family. And if you've been following the podcast, you'll know a lot of the detail. But we will just walk you back a bit to show a little bit about how all of this unfolded and how this murder came about. Now, Brianna Jai was just 16 years old and she was transgender. She suffered from anxiety and she didn't always feel very comfortable going out. So she spent a lot of time in her bedroom, but she had this really dedicated following on social media, people on there, thousands of people on there, loved her videos about clothes and makeup. But beyond those funny videos, she was also a huge support online to other young people feeling uncertain about their identity. And as someone who at times was crippled with anxiety, she knew how other people felt. 
So, on the day, a normal Saturday afternoon, almost exactly a year ago, this month, last year, this happened. She was due to meet her new friend Scarlett Jenkinson at the park. She was nervous and she was worried because she didn't always want to go out, as we've said, and we know this because she sent a text to her mum just articulating how she was feeling on the bus. And as mums do, Esther Jai texted back and said that she was so proud of her for going out that day um, because she'd managed to pluck up courage to go out for the day to the park like any other normal teenager. Tragically, we don't think that Brianna ever even read that final text from her mum. No, that's right. That's what we heard in court, Caroline. And so we know that going out was a really big deal for Brianna. And, you know, she could never have known the real plan that day not to hang out or have fun or maybe take some drugs, as Scarlett Jenkinson has suggested. But in fact, there was a murder plan, dreamt up and written down on a scrap of paper in Scarlett Jenkinson's bedroom, where we know she immersed herself in horror films and even began watching real-life torture and murder on underground websites online. And we can actually tell you now a lot more about the background to Brianna's two killers now they've been unmasked. Yeah, so we know that they'd known each other since they started Culture High School, aged 11, because they were in the same school year. But in September 2022, Scarlett Jenkinson was suspended and then moved out of Culture for giving drugs, specifically cannabis gummies, to another pupil. And we believe this happened in the library. Now, this girl took two of these sweets and she ended up being very poorly, that she went to A&E and then the police were called. Now, the parents of the girl, who was just 13 at the time, so younger than Scarlett Jenkinson, didn't want to take it any further, so she wasn't prosecuted. But as we said, she was moved. And Liz, actually, you've spoken to the dad of another pupil from the school who knew a little bit about what had gone on then. Yes, so I've spoken to the father of another pupil at Culture High who told me that the incident was actually a massive deal at the time because the other girl, who he described as being poisoned, ended up in hospital. Now, he told me he felt his daughter had had a lucky escape and that parents at Culture feel really, really sad for Brianna's family, but many of them are so thankful for their own children that Scarlett Jenkinson was moved away from their school. Yeah, so then she was moved to Birchwood High School. And this is significant, Liz, because this is where Brianna was a pupil. Now, we've been told that Scarlett Jenkinson was placed in a special unit called the Inclusion Unit with other children who had extra needs or vulnerabilities. And it's in this unit that she meets Brianna, who we also know, as we said, suffered with anxiety and needed some extra help. Initially, the girls chatted, as they do, normal teenage girls, about makeup, and they became friends. But that friendship turned into a really sinister obsession for Scarlett Jenkinson. You might remember a couple of months later, after meeting Brianna, she sent this WhatsApp message to Eddie Ratcliffe about her new friend. I'm obsessed over someone I know, but don't have feelings for them. She's called Brianna. I don't know how to explain. Also, she has a dick, lol. And because Scarlett Jenkinson and Brianna became friends at school in Warrington, the council, um, which is the body responsible for schools in the area, have today announced that they've commissioned an independent child safeguarding review. Now, this is going to examine whether more could have been done to protect Brianna from Scarlett Jenkinson. The council won't divulge exactly what this review entails, Caroline, They say it's policy not to reveal publicly the terms of reference of this review. But we know it will look at Scarlett Jenkinson's interaction with various different agencies, such as the police, social services and the schools in the borough. We're going to have to wait until it's published to see whether there's any significance in the fact that Scarlett Jenkinson was moved from one school to another in Warrington and consequently into Brianna's orbit by the authorities. Yeah, and we do know from talking to other people with children at the school and evidence throughout this trial that Scarlett Jenkinson had been interested in serial killers and the occult from the age of 14. We know she had this kill list of other pupils that she wanted rid of. And around six months before Brianna's murder, we know she started watching people being tortured and murdered on the dark web. You might remember the interview that we did with the um, expert on the dark web where she'd, Alan talked us through downloading the Onion router. Yeah. 
um, that special browser which allowed her to access these the sort of the dark web without anybody knowing. In these and, horrible red rooms. Yeah, and that's where she found it, and that's where she was spending a lot of her time. Now, we also know that she was close enough. She felt a sort of bond enough with Eddie Ratcliffe to divulge this secret obsession and fantasy. And she seemed to have absolutely no inhibitions when we looked at those messages that they were sending about talking about knives and how to murder other children. Now, we know they wanted to kill a different child a few weeks before, but their plan failed when he didn't fall for their trick to meet up. So Brianna then became the next target. And of course, we also now know that she tried to kill Brianna with ibuprofen tablets a few weeks Mm. before. So this was all sort of part of the plan. And that was something else we know that she admitted to in one of these interviews that she had with with the doctors in the secure unit. Now, we know Brianna, as we said, was anxious. She was vulnerable. She didn't like going out, but she did pluck up the courage that day to go to the park because it was Scarlett Jenkinson who asked her to go. And as we'll hear later from Esther Jai, she was trusted by Brianna. She was trusted by the family. They thought she was her friend. So why wouldn't she go? And in fact, what you'll hear later in Esther Jai's statement is that she was pleased She was thrilled. She was proud of her daughter for going out that day to meet Scarlett Jenkinson at the park because it felt like a normal teenage thing to happen. They obviously could never know what was going to happen next. That's right. And Caroline, what happened next was unimaginable. And uh, we now know, don't we, that they fulfilled this appalling fantasy um, that Scarlett Jenkinson had and had planned Once they got Brianna to the park, they stabbed her over and over again with the hunting knife that Eddie Ratcliffe's father had bought on that skiing trip just a few weeks before. And Scarlett Jenkinson and Eddie Ratcliffe were seen that day by dog walkers, disturbed committing the murder by the dog walkers, so they ran away. They dumped Brianna's phone into a drain near Scarlett Jenkinson's house and split up. We know that Scarlett Jenkinson got changed when she got home and it's likely that she actually washed some of her clothing. She started searching online for new clothes to buy. Eddie Ratcliffe hid the knife that had been used in the murder in his wardrobe and he started searching online for signs of anxiety. But Scarlett Jenkinson told him later on that he didn't need to worry because the police wouldn't catch them because they were shite. But she was wrong. Liz, within 24 hours, they were being arrested on the landings outside their bedroom doors. And we have that footage which was recorded on a police body cam, which we can play to you now. This is the moment Eddie Ratcliffe is arrested. You Eddie? Yeah. Eddie, you're locked up suspicion of murder, all right? You don't have to say anything, but you may harm your defence. You don't mention when questioned. So you later line in court, and if you do say we have evidence, do you understand? Yeah. I cannot explain it. No, listen. Right, listen. Do it all on interview, all right? Yeah. You're going to take it to the corner, you'll be interviewed about it, they'll ask you questions, all right? Yeah. Now, you obviously can't see the footage. I'm sure you will be able to see that in lots of outlets across the evening. But what you can hear Eddie Ratcliffe saying there is, I can explain. And initially, Liz, we know he was cooperating with the police. But once the sort of mountain of forensic evidence was presented, he stopped cooperating. He stopped speaking to the officers. And we now know, of course, that he has been diagnosed with selective mutism. And during the trial, he gave his evidence in writing. Yes, and here's the moment Scarlett Jenkinson was arrested. Scarlett, this is what I've got to say. Yeah. This moment, because the information I have received, you were under arrest on suspicion of murder. Obviously you are under caution, so anything you say is getting recorded. Okay. If um, me being suspect is because like, I was the last person I've seen or like, how come I'm a suspect? Pardon? How come I'm a suspect? How come you're a suspect? Because I'm the last person I've seen or is it? I don't know, all the all information I've received is you are a, a suspect, okay, for the murder. Yeah. And what you can hear on that footage is Scarlett Jenkinson asking the officer 
if she's a suspect because she was the last person to see Brianna alive. So we heard there the moment that their cruel but incredibly naive plan started to unravel. And once the police had them in custody, the evidence against them just started to build. The kill list Scarlett Jenkinson had written, the murder plan that she'd written, left in plain sight in her bedroom, the obsession with serial killers and torture, the messages they exchanged on WhatsApp, and then this pretty pathetic attempt, really, to run away and hide evidence. Yeah, the judge actually said today that that was childlike, um, their kind of incapacity to try and cover up what they'd done. But then we know they started to blame each other, didn't they? And Scarlett Jenkinson said everything that she'd written down was a fantasy. And she said that she never thought Eddie Ratcliffe would go through with it. In contrast, he said that she was to blame and that he was actually going to the toilet by a tree in the park when he turned around and saw Scarlett Jenkinson stabbing Brianna. But the jury didn't believe them and in just a few hours they convicted them back in December. But today, Caroline, we learned something extraordinary. Yeah, we did. We learned that in January, Scarlett Jenkinson was seen by a doctor in the secure unit where she's being held. And in this meeting with this doctor, she confessed to stabbing Brianna. She said she had stabbed her a lot. In fact, it was more times than she could remember. She even said she instructed Eddie to bring the knife that day and that she took over the killing because he couldn't do it. She also admitted to trying to poison Brianna with ibuprofen a few weeks before she killed her. Now, this is what Deanna here, the prosecutor, told the court today. She told psychologist Richard Church that at the time of the killing, she had in fact administered stab wounds herself. She said that she had snatched the knife from Eddie's hand and stabbed Brianna repeatedly. She said that Eddie had thrown Brianna to the floor and stabbed her three or four times. Then he panicked and said he didn't want to kill her, so Scarlett carried on and stabbed her a number of times. When asked how many times, she said, a lot. She said she understood she stabbed Brianna enough times to kill her, that she was satisfied and excited by what she was doing. She was asked about motivation and said although Eddie didn't like Brianna because she was transgender, her motivation was different. She said she enjoyed thinking about planning to kill Brianna, but her motivation for doing so was because she considered Brianna was a friend and she anticipated that Brianna was going to leave her and wanted to kill her so she could always be with her. She also admitted that she intended to take part of Brianna's body as a token, part of her flesh. And she admitted the earlier incident, when Brianna was administered ibuprofen, that when she had given Brianna those tablets, pretending that they would get her high, she did so with the intention to poison Brianna. Caroline, this was a complete shock, as she said throughout that she never stabbed Brianna, and everything that she'd said in the messages that she'd sent to Eddie Ratcliffe about killing her was just a fantasy. And she pleaded not guilty and forced Brianna's family to sit through the trial in all its distressing details, but has never accepted any part in the killing. But then, in a conversation with a probation officer, she said something different. Scarlett was interviewed by a member of the Youth Justice Service, and although she gave a similar account to the probation officer, her account of the actual killing did differ. She said it was she who inflicted the first stab wound. She passed the knife to Eddie, who forced the victim to the floor, stabbed the victim three times, and at that point she took the knife from him, and inflicted the majority of the stab wounds. So she has made admissions of guilt, but there are some inconsistencies. And now, today, Liz, her KC, Richard Pratt, told the court that she's taken back both of those confessions, yeah? Yeah, so he said she was now maintaining today that Eddie Ratcliffe did the majority of the stabbing. So she's repeatedly changing her story depending on who she speaks to. And it's unclear if either of the confessions are true or if she just wants to paint herself in the worst possible light because she wants the notoriety. And of course, that feeds into what the judge says, Liz, about her truthfulness. Yeah, the judge said to the court that essentially it was impossible now to believe anything she said. 
Now, we've had the criminologist, Professor David Wilson, on the podcast before, and he's been following this case for us as well. And he told us this pair represents something that I'd never heard of before. Now, he called it a typical folie à deux. Now, basically, this means, when you translate it, if you like, a shared madness. And he compared their relationship, and they, we should say they're not a couple, they're friends. They're They've always friend just been friends, yeah. He compared them to Ian Brady, Myra Hindley, Fred and Rose West. He said they basically needed each other in order for this crime to have been committed. But he also said it's clear to him who holds the power in this relationship. And he told us that Scarlett Jenkinson is highly manipulative. I, I think uh, Jenkinson's confession that she also stabbed Brianna, which she had initially denied placing all the blame on Ratcliffe is very significant because I think through that confession, what we are beginning to see is the actual workings of the power relationship between the two and how unusually it's her, the woman who's in charge of this particular folie de. Of course, Jenkinson has subsequently withdrawn her confession that she was actively involved in the stabbing of Brianna. And naturally, there'll be a, a common sense presumption that nothing she says can be trusted. However, I tend to think that withdrawal of the confession is merely another way of manipulating uh, Ratcliffe, of trying to keep some control over Ratcliffe. She certainly doesn't want to feel that she will be punished in a way that's different to how he's going to be punished. And therefore, this is really just the withdrawal of the confession is just another form of manipulation. And the judge also said, Caroline, that Scarlett Jenkinson's behaviour in the secure unit where she's being held in Leeds was very troubling. And we think she was referring here to this other kill list that has been mentioned in court today that she'd written while she was in the unit. Now, apparently on that list are a number of people who've been looking after her while she's been in custody. And Mrs Justice Ship told her that she would have a lot of work to do if she was ever to be rehabilitated and considered for parole. We also heard, Caroline, about Scarlett Jenkinson's recent diagnosis of a personality disorder and how a psychiatrist who'd assessed her no longer believes she has ADHD or autism traits, as was suggested during the trial. So there's no sign of mental illness, if you like? No, but she has been diagnosed with anorexia and the personality disorder means she lacks empathy, which the judge said could explain why she was able to commit such a dreadful crime. Um, but Professor Wilson told us she's a selfish, dangerous person. No, of course, the, uh, the sentencing process is completed. There'll be a legitimate desire to understand what was motivating uh, Jenkinson to behave in the way that she did. And we'll hear all sorts of fancy labels being applied to her conduct. And of course, we've already got conduct disorder diagnosis that she lacks uh, pro-social emotions. Um, now, th that doesn't mean to say that she's mentally ill. She's not hearing voices. Uh, she's not schizophrenic. She's not um, psychotic. Um, and I think really what we're seeing is just somebody who's got a profound antisocial personality disorder. It's important to have those definitions because those help us to think about what would be a suitable treatment. But frankly, uh, this is somebody who prioritizes herself, her needs, is manipulative, is arrogant, is impulsive. Uh, is dangerous. She's dangerous because she is particularly sadistic. So before we finish this special episode of the podcast, we need to take you back to the beginning of the day, to the moment we heard from Brianna's family. They were allowed to address the court about not only the moment they opened the door, to the news that she would never be coming home again, but how they've coped since and the toll this has taken on them. They wrote victim impact statements and they were read to the court... Now, they were so powerful that we've voiced them up for you. We'll start with Brianna's sister, Alicia. Throughout the last year of Brianna's life, our family had a lot to worry about. She was easily influenced and putting herself into dangerous situations. The worst thing that could possibly happen, our worst anxiety, came true. The memory of the night I was told we lost her has overpowered many of the happy memories I have of growing up alongside Brianna. 
I will never forget the night I opened the door to the two shook up police when I was alone in my house. Brianna was always at home and I didn't know she had left that day. When they asked me if there is anybody else in the house, I said she's in her room. When I checked and she wasn't there, my heart ached. I feel this every time I come home to Brianna not being there. After a while, this became unbearable. I find being in my own home uncomfortable and lonely. The week of finding out she had been taken from us, the house was silent. Our life had changed completely. I couldn't sleep, and all that I could think of is the missing presence of my sister. I can't remember life without her. I haven't been away from her for this long since before she was born. The loss of a younger sibling to something so horrific is indescribably painful, like a part of me is missing. I learned to do everything with her, and I feel that now she is gone, I can't keep growing as I did when I was with her. The anger and frustration of this time went on and grew. The speculations going around further grew my anxieties of what trauma my sister was put through. I spent a lot of time away from home to get away from the sadness and anger, and when I'd come back, so would these dark feelings. I never felt alone with Brianna in the house. I would tell her everything, and she would listen. Not having that makes me feel more alone than ever. I now feel anxious. I struggle to trust new people that I meet because it was Brianna's friend who she trusted that took her life. I worry that the same thing might happen to me, my friends or family. I have attended counselling sessions but felt that no one could understand the pain I am going through and no one can ever make me feel better. The only thing that would make me happy again would be if I could hear Brianna's voice and laughter and cuddle up on my bed watching a film together like we used to do. But I will never get my sister back and I must carry that pain for the rest of my life. Brianna's dad, Peter, was next. As Brianna's father, it is impossible to put into words how the murder of my child has affected me. I have been deprived of so many memories and time with her. Being a father of a transgender child was a difficult thing to deal with. Without people accusing me of deadnaming my child, most of my memories are with my son Brett. Our memories are engraved on my heart. He was funny, cheeky and would pull faces to make me laugh. He was my baby, my only son, and his decision to transition was such a brave and confident thing to do. Even though I grieved the son I lost, I was proud to gain another beautiful daughter. Her appearance changed as she blossomed into a lovely young girl. Her eyes were the same. She had my eyes when I looked at her. We were forming a new relationship and these two murderers have stolen that from us both. I hate how Brianna's life has been brutally taken away from her and she has been deprived of the life she wanted to live. She never had the chance to sit her exams or go on to further education. Now my world has been torn apart. Justice may have been done with the guilty verdicts, but no amount of time spent in prison will be enough for these monsters. I cannot call them children, as that makes them sound naive or vulnerable, which they are not. They are pure evil. Brianna was the vulnerable one. They were determined to kill and never gave up until they had blood on their hands. My Brianna's blood. Not an ounce of remorse has been shown from these murderers, putting myself and my family through this awful trial, having to hear the details about how Brianna suffered. It is unforgivable. The impact of Brianna's death has affected our whole family. Personally, this has affected me in many ways. I have been signed off work with personal stress until after the sentencing, but I will never come to terms with the loss of my daughter. My employer has been very understanding throughout. Since the trial finished, I felt in a rut and struggle some days to focus on things. It's hard moving forward knowing I will never see my child again. Every day, something will remind me of what Brianna went through that day in February 2023. Something as simple as taking the dog for a walk in a wooded area or seeing something on TV can trigger those emotions. 
I wish I wasn't standing here reading this statement today. But if I wasn't, then there would have been another father stood here in my shoes. Another child from their list would have been brutally murdered and I wouldn't wish this terror and pain onto another person. And finally, this was Brianna's mum, Esther's statement. Brianna was an extremely vulnerable teenager. As Brianna's mother, I was constantly worried that she was putting herself in risky situations. She was diagnosed with ADHD and ASD as a teenager. With these conditions, she found it extremely difficult to identify dangerous situations. Although in this case, no one could have predicted that it was a dangerous situation for Brianna. This was the hardest thing for me and the rest of Brianna's family to come to terms with. Finding out that one of the people who had been charged for her murder was someone we believed to be her friend. Someone that we trusted. Someone that I was so happy that she had, fearing that my child had been lonely. Not knowing that this person had been planning to not only cause harm, but to take the life of my precious child. I tried to protect Brianna so much when she was putting herself in harm's way, and I failed by allowing her to meet Scarlett on that Saturday afternoon. I was pleased to receive the text from Brianna on the afternoon of the 11th of Feb, telling me that she was going out to meet her friend. In order to meet her, Brianna had managed to get on a bus by herself, something that was a first and a big deal for her. I had been concerned that Brianna wouldn't be able to get herself to college due to her anxiety, and this was a big breakthrough for her. I thought that she would have a wonderful time hanging around with her friend and getting some fresh air when all that time she was being lured to her death. All I can think about is that she would have been scared and I wasn't there for her. She needed me to protect her. Brianna wasn't a fighter and she must have been so terrified. The day of and the days following 11th of February were and always will be the worst days of my life. I felt like someone had killed part of me, like my heart had been ripped out. I had never felt such grief and I would never wish that pain on anyone else. At night, I shared my bed with Alicia as neither of us could sleep alone. I couldn't eat and was in a complete daze, just living one day after the next. Our home was so quiet with Brianna gone. Whenever I went into my bedroom, I'd put my ear against the wall that divided mine and Brianna's rooms to try and hear her chatting and giggling on FaceTime to her friends there was only silence. When I walked through the front door, I expected her to come down the stairs to ask for a Domino's pizza for tea, but there was only silence. I would go into her bedroom to ask where she had gone and if she was okay. It broke my heart to know that I would never get a response and I would never hear her voice again. I desperately wanted to know that she was okay and that she wasn't alone and in pain anymore. The fact that Brianna was taken from me in such a heinous way causes a pain that I struggle to describe. No parent should ever have to bury their child. She should have been around for the rest of my life. Brianna had plans for her future, which we will never have the chance to support her with. She wanted to go to college and study beauty therapy. She was looking forward to being old enough to have a little job like her big sister. We had also discussed her learning to drive and she had even picked out which pink car she would like for her 18th birthday. When I remember the good memories that we made together, it hurts so much because she's not here anymore to remember them with me, and we will never get the chance to make more memories together. Instead, the final memories that I carry are the memories of hearing the news that my child had been found dead, memories of identifying Brianna's lifeless body, memories of her funeral, And now, to add to that, memories of the trial where the two people responsible for Brianna's death have cowardly pointed the finger towards each other, showing no remorse and only interested in defending themselves. Our lives have completely changed because of this crime. I try to go back to work weeks after Brianna's death, but going back to my normal way of life just highlighted that she wasn't with us. I would drive home knowing that she wouldn't be there when I arrived. As a result... I haven't worked since March. Brianna's sister, Alicia, chooses to stay at her boyfriend's house for most of the time because she feels such grief at home. It is so quiet without Brianna, and this is unbearable for her. Brianna was killed when Alicia was in college, 
studying for her second year of A-levels. Alicia has always been a promising student who enjoyed learning and achieving, but she has struggled and decided to quit college for now. She has lost confidence in her abilities due to the time that she had off to deal with her grief, and I worry that the trauma that Alicia has experienced could negatively impact the rest of her life. I believe that both Scarlett and Eddie continue to be a danger to society. Their behaviour has impacted my family terribly and I would never want them to have the opportunity to carry out their sadistic fantasies on another vulnerable person. As I've mentioned, I have another daughter and one day I will hopefully have grandchildren. I want to help make society a safer place for them to grow up and the thought of Scarlett and Eddie being released from prison absolutely horrifies me. I don't believe that someone who is so disturbed and obsessed with murder and torture would ever be able to be rehabilitated. I have moments where I feel sorry for them because they have also ruined their own lives, but I have to remember that they felt no empathy for Brianna when they left her bleeding to death after their premeditated and vicious attack, which was carried out not because Brianna had done anything wrong, but just because one hated trans people and the other thought it would be fun. Thank you.